Hello again. How you doing? Welcome back to The Brave Front, a podcast with a single purpose, to talk about men's mental health. My name's Tim Bainan, and here's what's coming up in this episode. So I would monitor our communication networks um, for reports of any British casualties, whether they were injured or they were killed. And these were posts often accompanied by pictures or videos of whatever had happened. But what this actually translated into was I spent 10 weeks in a room on my own, and I'm literally, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a manager or anything, watching people being killed and injured in, in ways that I don't want anybody to try and imagine. As time went on, I think I didn't realise it, it did start to take its toll on me. Um, so there were a couple of incidents where I'd I'd see something, I'd read something. It's actually amazing the power. Words can be just as powerful as pictures or videos can be. And you don't realise until you do, until you're exposed to something like that. And where I'd see things and I'd sit back in my chair and I'd go, Jesus, I, I need to go take a moment. And what happened with me is I had a, um, a 1911, Colt 1911 air pistol underneath my bed. And I had tweaked it to maybe be above power. That it may, that may be recommended, if that makes sense. Loaded it, put the magazine in, racked the slides, put it in my mouth. And I basically sat there ne- next to the bed, upstairs, with my finger on the trigger. Then these days, writing these kids' books, it's a way of me taking this really you know, tough part of my life, trying to turn it into a positive and then using that positive message and I try to articulate that to what a child will understand. And yet it's really nice to be able to, to use that to, to help kids and help people. That was Pete White, a former communications specialist in the RAF and present day children's author, whose own story with mental health has taken him from the darkness of Camp Bastion in Afghanistan to an inspired night of writing that is now reshaping his future. Living with PTSD as a result of the horrors he witnessed when he was at war, Peter's faced challenges to his mental health that have over the years seen him diagnosed with psychosis and driven to the point of suicide. Today though, inspired by his young son, he has found an outlet in writing that has given him a new direction helping youngsters to understand their own feelings and to recognise when their parents might also be struggling, Pete's new series of books is receiving rave reviews. We've got a copy of Pete's first book to give away. So take a moment to subscribe, leave us a rating, drop us a review and keep listening till the end of the show for more details of how you can win a copy of The Anxious Night. So, the interview you're about to listen to touches on the incredible power of creativity as a means to help people through poor mental health. And it seems there is a strong link between PTSD and creativity in particular. Indeed, looking into it a bit further, a 2014 study by Dr. Marie Fulgard found strong evidence to support the idea that those who experience trauma can be more inclined to be creative afterwards. Other studies have also shown that trauma can have a reawakening effect on creativity, which a 2020 study concluded was used as a coping mechanism and a way to demonstrate personal growth. Meanwhile, Art, music, dance and creative writing therapies are now commonly offered to people recovering from trauma or living with trauma-related mental health conditions, all of which help people to explore their feelings and, to crucially, relax. So, whether it's writing a book or hosting a podcast, finding some way to express yourself creatively, as Pete White is about to tell us, can help you to understand and to live with what's going on in your head. Pete, welcome to the Brave Front. Delighted you're able to make it and, and join us this morning. How's it going? How are you? Um, th- thanks so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. It's good. Yeah, it's really good. A v- very, very busy time of year, but I'm happy being busy. So uh, all is good. Thank you. Yes. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm all right. Thanks. Yeah, not too bad. Again, likewise, busy at the moment. Lots going on, but um, always nice to find time to chat to someone like yourself. So all good. All good. But I must ask you, how's uh, how's life as an author? How are you finding life as an author? Hectic. Um, it's great. I love it, and you know, certainly getting get the feedback about about the books from people and how they've made an impact and stuff is is phenomenal. You know, to to be able to have that kind of impact on people is is brilliant. 
But the life of an indie author, so somebody who has been published under a large publishing body, is a hectic one because, you know, I work full time as well. I've got a two year old myself, you know, I've got a house to run, and then you've got constant marketing of yeah. your books, basically. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, I'm not going to complain. I do love it, but at the same time, it has become a second business, which I didn't really need a second business. Um, I haven't really got that time to spare. But yeah, it it is. It's really cool, and to having that impact is is brilliant. Yeah, you yeah, as you say, you're not only an author, you've got to be a marketeer as well. You've got to be able to sort of push it all out yourself. That's hard work. Not not an easy job. Yeah, I'm I'm certainly not a natural salesman, uh, but it's both. But because I run my own business on the side, well, on the side that as as, as a full time job, and then doing this and yeah, I've had to become good at sales, which is a yeah. a begrudging skill, but one I've had to pick up. Is writing and being an author something you've always wanted to do, or would your past self have been amazed at what you're doing today? Oh, I'd, I'd be amazed. Um, not only because I wasn't exactly the best student in school, um, I was never one to do my homework or particularly listen to the teacher. In fact, I, I, I got by my, my secondary school days by making people laugh by swearing, basically. That, that was my part of trick, was just to swear. Um, it works. It was simpler times back then. But um, yeah, so no, it was, um, I kind of f- first dabbled in becoming an author in 2018 and 19. So when I left the military, I ended up almost accidentally writing a book um, about my journey through kind of mental illness. And because it's safe to say things got quite spicy in, in my time, which I'm sure we'll discuss in a few minutes. And it initially just started out as notes in the back of, of you know, a, a notebook in, in that carried in my jeans. And these were just memories and realizations and lessons learned from what at that point was the last six years of my life. And this grew and it grew into a second notebook. And then I started to transfer these notes over to my phone. And that almost, almost became, these notes almost became like chapters of a book. And then I started to write more about each of those chapters, as it were. And it just naturally grew. And eventually I said, you know what, sod it, I'll, I'll publish it on Amazon. And, uh, you know, it didn't become a bestseller or anything like that, but it, it sold fairly well. And I think what I, I realized for me was the power of, vulnerability and the power of a, of a story and how people who were reading it were able to relate to what I'd be talked through or, or talked about or they had somebody in their life who had gone through something similar and that book could help them actually see it from from another perspective and so that was my first kind of dabble into it didn't touch it for a few years um and then when my son was born he's two and a half now I wanted Zach my son to understand you know, the fact that his dad has has PTSD, which is a form of anxiety. Um, and I, I I was kind of toyed with the idea of a knight, like a medieval knight in, in his armour and his helmet and his sword, who underneath all of that was actually really anxious and really struggled. And it kind of went from there, really. And uh, again, the way this, this series came about was, was almost accidental. And because it came about when I couldn't sleep one night, you know, I've got yeah. PTSD and, and, and insomnia is a common common part of PTSD. Couldn't sleep one night, went downstairs, got my laptop at about two o'clock in the morning, just ended up smashing out a bunch of words on paper. Didn't even know if they made sense or not. And then I thought, well, I used to be really severely depressed, so it would be nice if Zach understood depression. So I wrote a book about depression, about a, a blacksmith who was depressed. And it just went from there, and he ended up writing seven books in one night. I, I want to come on to that night because because that fascinates me and I, I, obviously I read a little bit about you before we before we met and and yeah that's seven seven books in a night is is epic so I want to come I want to come on to that in a bit um, <laughs> yeah because that's that's quite I, somebody's written written one book and it took me three years <laughs> seven in a night is quite it's quite amazing anyway I want to, I want to come on to that but tell yep. me a little bit about well first of all just going back to what you were saying then about about those those note that note taking and that sort of process of writing things down. At mm. that time, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about your career and, and life in the military in a bit, if that's okay. But mm-hmm. as you as you sort of, you've touched on it, was have you found that sort of writing things down, the process of getting things down on paper, is that some kind is that kind of therapy for you in a way in terms of helping you to rationalise what's going on in your head? Is that is that the process? Yeah, ab- absolutely. It's for me, it's a way of making sense what's in my head because my head is a bit of a hectic playground. Um, it's like a whole bunch of kids who've taken a whole lot of e-numbers and, and sugar and stuff and 
trying to get a hold of, of, of individual thoughts or tasks or worries and stuff is, is hard. So I found a lot of benefit in writing. Um, I still do it now. What I, what I do is I do a weekly brain dump every Sunday. I just sit down and just dump things out onto paper. And it just helps me take stock, helps me understand, and helps me plan. Because if, if you were to say to anybody, can you tell me the top three emotions you're feeling right now? They're not they're really going to struggle to do that. But if you write down on paper what's going on and how you feel about that, it becomes a lot easier. And that's, that's, that for me is why it's so beneficial. And yeah, I, I love jotting things down. I'm totally with you on that. I've been through, you know, I, I, I had, a, I had a, a cancer diagnosis a few years back and went through that whole process and, and treatment and all that kind of stuff. And I found that during that time, there were two things that worked for me. Running was one and then writing was the second. So both of those things were the sort of the crutches that I lent on during that time to kind of see me through. And I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have them. So I totally, yeah. totally understand where you're coming from on that front. Listen, let's, 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 before we dig into a bit more of that and a bit more of the of your sort of your military career, do you want to just talk me through a little bit about your background and and your sort of early career and and sort of what led you up to the military and and, and sort of so tell us a little bit of your backstory, if you like? Yeah, so originally I'm from Teesside, um, I saw a, a fairly small town called Billingham, um, and there's really not much there. It was I think it was it was created to basically staff uh, local chemical plants and stuff and steel work and that kind of thing. And So there's, there's not much there. Um, when I was 18, I um, travelled to South Africa for a bit to do some volunteer work just because I fancied it really. And that kind of sums up a lot of my life is just, let's just do it because I want to. Then came back home, worked for three and a bit years in outdoor pursuits. So I was to do, I was an instructor for things like climbing, quad biking, hiking, shooting, all kinds of stuff. And that was great. Um, that was like a student lifestyle, but doing fun stuff and getting paid for it. Um, not getting paid much, but we got paid. And then I left, and I, I'd, I'd always wanted to join the military. My, my dad was in the military, so was my granddad, so was, was my uncle, until relatively recently, actually. And it was always kind of on the cards for me. So I ended up joining the, uh, the, uh, the Air Force as a communications engineer. And yeah, that's kind of when my, my, my career started. That was 2009 that I joined up. And how, how old were you at that time? A lifetime ago. 21, I believe, Okay, uh, when, I, when I first joined. Um, so I was a bit older com- compared to some of the recruits going in. I uh, had a bit more life experience. And that's something I recommend to a lot of people is is before you do something like that, get some life experience under your belt if you're able to, because it, it does make things a lot easier doing something like that with, yeah, with a bit of life experience there. And what I tried to do to that role to to so so you say it was the Air Force first of all and and uh, <laughs> communications and engineer did you say communications engineer yeah you keep, keep saying, yeah 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 so is it the Air Force largely because that that's what my dad was in and that's what my um, my granddad was in, was in as well and my uncle for that matter do all the Air Force and it just again seemed like kind of a natural course of action for me I had considered the army I'd considered you know the infantry or things like combat engineering which is a bit like, it, like infantry, just with a bit more engineering skills going in. And I, I did go to the, the careers office one time. I uh, spoke to the army recruiter there, who I believe was in his last four years in the military. So I last four weeks in the military, I should say. Um, and he was basically past caring. Wasn't bothered about whether or not he recruited the people or not. So I'm really thankful to him because he said to me, you're overqualified for what you're looking to do here. Don't join the army. Join the Air Force. Which surprised because I'm not didn't really have many major qualifications, but um, yes. Yeah, so and then went went so sort of spoke over to the uh, the Air Force guys. In terms of communications, I was always good at IT. And um, when I was in school, I was always a bit of a geek, and I, I wanted to have a career. Where when I came out, I had a skill that I could use. Um, something I always feared was serving for twenty odd years, for example, coming out and going, okay, what the hell do I do now? Uh, which a lot of people do find themselves in that position. So uh, I spoke to him about that. They told me there was a brand new spanking trade, which it just basically it, they brought together two different trade sets into this one trade called, um, it was trade group four, I can't remember the proper name for it was. It's changed six times since then. And uh, yeah, it just seemed like a very natural thing uh, to go into, into comms. And it was it's a very broad skill set. So you might be talking about satellites or radios or, IT or phones or so many different options there, even things like cyber security radio or your hacking stuff. I never really, really got into that. So yeah, and I, I like the fact that it was varied and I could kind of get my teeth into different things. And, and, and 
how did your career progress from those early days and, and how did it sort of go forward um, from there? Yeah, so I, w- I went to basic training, um, ended up spending six months there, should be nine weeks, but I, I was injured. Um, I got injured after do rehab. So after I was at, um, where was basic training? Now, Arie of Horton, um, it was my basic, and then moved on to Arie of Cosford in the Wolverhampton and did my trade training. I was there for about a year and a half and just learned. It was it was a bit like learning to drive, as in you learn what you need to know to pass the tests, and then actually when you go to do the job, that's when you learn the job. Yeah, and that was that was fine. It was you know we had a bit more freedom, but it was still a lot of kind of inspections and marching around and pointless stuff. Then I went to I was posted. My first proper post was Aria Fleming up in North Yorkshire, and I was on a unit called the uh, Tactical Communications Wing or TCW for short, and. Their job really is to deploy as as a squadron, because there's four squadrons, to whatever part of the world has something kicking off and set up the comms for whoever needs it, whether that is army or navy or special forces or whoever. And um, yeah, provide the comms and usually the, the, the links back to the UK and stuff. And that was kind of where a lot of people went because, you know, that had the image of, you know, the uh, the soldier and you go out and you combat with your rifle and do a, and yes we did that stuff for the reason it wasn't much there was soldiering going on and then it was only six months into that that I was deployed to Afghanistan um so it was 2011 by this point and I was really happy to deploy I I, I want I joined the Air Force wanting to make a change you know have an impact go somewhere. Uh, and see part of the world and stuff. And even to this day, despite what we're going to talk about, I am still really happy about it. I spent just shy of five months there. My first month was at Kandahar, just doing a very boring IT makes job. Then I was shipped over to Bastion. And at Bastion, the first 10 weeks of that was working in casualty reporting. So my job there was I would sit in an office on my own uh, every night between 7 p.m. and 8 a.m. And I would monitor six big screens on the wall. These six big, big screens had like black dots. The black dots were just our various presence all over Afghanistan. And the green lines were what, you know, the, the communication networks that connected us. My job was to monitor these green lines. If they turned red, I'd pick up the phone and go, it's broken. And that was it. And that was basically my job. And it was it was soul destroying. But there was a secondary part of the job. Um, and despite it being secondary, it took up a lot more time. You could argue it was more interesting. And that was uh, casualty reporting. So I would monitor our communication networks um, for reports of any British casualties, whether they were injured or they were killed. And these reports were often accompanied by pictures or videos of whatever had happened. And um, I would kind of um, take all the details down. I'd watch pictures of what happened. And so I'd watch videos and look at pictures. And yeah, I'd kind of create a timeline of, of events. But what this actually translated into was I spent... 10 weeks in a room on my own, man, I mean, literally, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a manager or anything, watching people being killed and injured in, in ways that I don't want anybody to try and imagine. So it would be fair to say this might have an impact on somebody's mental health. And it, it did for me. We'll come on to it in a few minutes, I'm sure. I got home and then about a year later, I was deployed to the Olympics in 2012. And I worked on a VIP security. So uh, worked for the likes of Jays of Statham, Sylvester Stallone, Elson John, all kinds of people. It was a really, really cool job. That was when my health started to deteriorate. And then in 2015, I was deployed again, but I stayed in the UK. But I was supporting operations, I think, over in Libya. Very boring. Nothing happened. Nothing interesting. So, yeah. And then um, it was 2017, I believe, when I was finally medically discharged due to my PTSD and depression. Um, so that, that that was my career. So rather than the full twenty two plus years I was aiming for, it was uh, nine just shy nine years I was in for. Um, yeah, that's how it panned out. Thank you for for, for summarising that and talking talking us through it. Obviously, you know, there's a lot there to to sort of unpick and to and to yeah. to chat through. Before we get to to um, you know what happened and and what happened in that room and and the, and the things you saw and and the impact that yeah. that had. Can you just just because I'm fascinated as well in terms of someone who who has never been in the military or, or attracted to that as a as a career, you said at the, at the start of that summary that that going to Afghanistan was something that you were looking forward to, you were excited about, you were pleased to do. Tell me about that mindset from a from your perspective in terms of you know from from for me personally, I'd be terrified at the prospect of having to do something like that. 
So what does it take mm. and what mindset do you have to have to be to be the kind of person who wants to put himself in that place? I think I think it's it, it's very individual. Um, I don't think anybody joins the military or deploys because they want to serve the government or what the government you know, orders that that type of stuff. It's 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 much closer to home than that. But at the same time, there is that element of we we have a certain element of power being a, you know a wealthy country and you know people who are in a position to help and. I believe that when you're in the military, you have that ability to help. And people often think of the military as, you know, death and fighting. And that is always going to be a part of that. Um, you know, it's, it's a part that I'm happy to see the, the 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 back of now. But I knew we were going to a country where people had been facing not just prejudice, but, you know, lethal threats and discrimination their entire lives. And what I wanted to, to hopefully do was have some small impact in um in in trying to help with that so for me the mindset was okay that's that's the task that's the job go out there it might be you know it might be awful it might be shit but let's let's get the job done and that is the very much the military mindset of head down crack on get it done i don't care if it's you know 50 degrees set again i don't care if it's raining i don't care if it's snowing get it done and that's something i've still carried on to some of my life now really but that, that for me was what it was about. I think when you haven't been in that world, you look at it from a very outside, very outside point of view. And it's quite hard to understand when you're in that world. It's just drilled into you from day one. Job to do, crack on and do it. Whether you're doing it for the people in the country or doing it for the guys next year, right? In most cases, both apply. So off you go, go do it. And that's, that's very much where the, where the mindset is. Sure. Well, I have the utmost respect for that because I think it's an incredible, you know, mindset to have and that willingness and that desire to help others. Obviously, it's an incredible, incredible personality trait to have, and it must require a very strong mind, mind to be able to, you know, to, to for that to be dominant over the prospects of putting yourself in 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 harm's way. So that's I have huge respect for you for that. But tell Thanks. me, tell me a little bit about um, about that room and what you were what you were talking through was the two sides to that. So you had the the boring side, the looking at the at the green lines and hoping they didn't turn red. Yep. And then you had the other side, obviously, the incredibly graphic side of, of, of that role, the casualty reporting. Nothing can tra- I'm, I'm assuming you can't train for that in any way at all. You know, you, no, other than the fact that people tell you this is what you're going to see, there's not much you can train for in that. What, you know, how, how did you, when you first started doing that, what was your initial thoughts of that, at that time and how did that change over, over time? It's a really interesting question. I think one one part of of this that we need to identify is that job before I did it didn't exist, right? So when I was sent to Bastion, I was basically surplus manpower, me and two of the guys, and they they created jobs for all three of us. So one went to work with the US Marines that were based there. One went to work on what was basically like a help desk for IT in the desert, and I went to do this. So there was there was no structure, there was no preparation, there was no, no real awareness of what I was going to be doing, you know, even things like we talk about like risk assessments, and yes, they're boring, but a risk assessment identifies this is what the job entails in, in detail. There was none of that. So when I first started, I mean, I I, I can't because of my my PTSD, I've, I've lost quite a lot of memory, so I couldn't pitch you on know, the first incidents that I, I dealt with. It's all a big blur for me. Um, if there's a couple I can pick out, but it was very much kind of just take it in your stride because we are in a war zone. Not you know, not very happen in a war zone. This is part of the job, and that that's that same mindset of head down, crack on, you know, job done. And then as time went on, I think I didn't realise it. It did start to take its toll on me. Um, so there were a couple of incidents where I'd I'd see something, I'd read something. It's actually amazing the power words can be just as powerful as pictures or videos can be, and you don't realise until you do until you expose something like that, and. Where I'd see things and I'd sit back in my chair and I'd go, Jesus, I, I need to go take a moment. And I think over there, it was a lot more real. So back home, you'd see news reports, you know, British servicemen, British servicewoman killed in Afghanistan. And you're very detached from that when, when you were home, um, you know, in the safety of your living room on the sofa. And in 10 minutes, you'll have forgotten that person's name. 
and still going back to whatever you were doing. When you're over there, it's real. You're there. It's visceral. It's happening in the moment. And in a very small way, you're a very, very small way. You're, you're part of that person's story. You know, they, they would obviously never know that. And I would never expect them to. So you feel much more involved with that than you would normally. Over time, yeah, things that did, 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 did can't say the word, did deteriorate. So um, I went through a period quite a while, actually, when I was over there, where I would read something or see something difficult. I would go binge on food. We got, we got sent a lot, a lot of welfare packages and usually shoeboxes by people. That was great. Really, really good, that. But I'd go binge on that stuff and then immediately have to go make myself vomit in, in the toilets. And that wasn't anything to do with an eating disorder. It was me trying to get control over something mm-hmm. in a situation that I had no control over. And, I mean, it showed up in funny ways. So I remember that there were a lot of flies in Afghanistan, which probably wouldn't surprise anybody. And we had a lot of flies in, in where I works. And I used to walk around with my berry folded up or rolled up. And I would sing a little song about being the uh, uh, the uh, fly sniper. And I'd go find <laughs> flies and hit them with the berry and kill them and stuff. And looking back, it's funny, but it's not normal behavior, especially when you're on your own. You're not, you're not performing for anybody here. So yeah, things things had to have an impact on me. That job came to an end after 10 weeks. And I think it came to an end possibly because the guys who I was in the tent with back in an accommodation. They all work days, I work nights. Uh, so we crossed paths for less than five minutes a day often. I think they could see something in myself. Mm-hmm. And in the in the pit next to me, uh, the, the the next bed was uh, a sergeant. It was my sergeant back in unit. So we didn't work together in Afghan, but we did work together back, back home. And I think it was probably him. Um, he wasn't a great sergeant, but one of the things that I think he did to me was kind of raise that and said, I think we need to pull Pete off this. And then I went to work on different jobs. But yeah, that's kind of, kind of how it rolled out. It was a very gradual thing. But at the time, I saw nothing wrong with it. And yeah. doing that stuff was my job. So I'd get on and do it kind of thing. Did you kind of become desensitized to what you were seeing to a degree? Because it yes. was every day? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I am still fairly desensitized to things like death. I, I don't deal with that death in a hell of a way because I become so matter of fact about it. You know, so if I were to lose somebody close to me, my first gut instinct is they had a good run. I hope it was quick for them. What's for tea? And it's not a particularly healthy way of dealing with with death, but it's the first place my head goes to. I mean, it sounds very cold, very clinical, and that isn't how it's it's meant to be. But that's almost how it is. Mm-hmm. It's it's a coping mechanism, and you know, you 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 do see in in the military and in medical fields and fire service and police, you see similar things where. People develop dark humour, and some of the jokes you'll hear muttered. You know, if they if they made news headlines, it'd be horrendous. But in in the in those circles, that's just the way people deal with things, and that is kind of where I was. Yeah, that's quite that's quite interesting. You say that. I mean, I I work for a charity that supports firefighters, the firefighters charity, and we so we support firefighters. And a lot of them come to us because they've similar similar to yourself. They they're suffering from from mental health issues as a result of working around trauma. Uh, um, and a lot of what they tell us is that is that they do find support in dark humour and in comradeship and in talking about it yeah. with uh, bad jobs with their with their you know watchmates and so on and so forth. But it sounds to me like you were in quite a lonely role, though. You know, you, you're you're yes. one man in a in a room. Did you yeah. have that sort of comradeship there to support you at all, or or was it the fact that you're working nights by yourself? It's 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 that sounds to me like quite a a lonely position to be in. Oh, yeah, very, very much so. Yeah. So yeah, I was on my own. Like I said, there was uh, how many beds did we have? I think it was eight eight pits in a, in a tent, and seven of the other uh, the other seven guys in mine all worked days. So I didn't you know have anybody to talk to when I would hand over um, from my shift to the guy who was what's called the day watchman, and he didn't do the casualty award. He just did the monitoring things, and I think he was like an office busybody kind of thing. Um, doing what what you call um, uh, uh, gas jobs. And, you know, spoke to him for three or four minutes because I wanted to get off and get to the gym and get to bed, basically. So the, there was nothing in place, no structure, no support, nobody to talk to. And I suspect that's why I became the uh, the fly sniper, was my kind of way of trying to uh, find some kind of humour and, and, and uh, brevity in, in this. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very strange thing. These yeah. days, I find a lot of comfort. So, for example, on, on Sunday coming, so as as we record this, 
it is uh, Armistice Day on Saturday, tomorrow I believe, and then the following Sunday is the, the parades and stuff. And I, I hate the parades. It's it's quite a painful experience, but I go go to them. I mean, after my favourite part is I'll go to the pub, and keep in mind that I barely drink these days with a few uh, ex-forces lads, and that's when I'm uh, sometimes my happiest. Because yeah. we'll tell these stories, we'll have a laugh, we'll have the dark humour. I've been chatting to them before, and you've seen tables extras near the pubs, like staring as open mouth because of the stuff we're saying. Not because we're looking to be offensive, because that's just the humour we use and how we cope. It's like um, shared, un- shared understanding, isn't it? You you just you get yeah. each other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I love it. That, that that for me is kind of a yearly kind of little release, really. And I'll, I'll have, a, have a few pints, which is the worst I'll drink all year, basically. And just tell me a little bit about you know th- that that time during 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 those weeks when you were on that on that job and and you know and you became the, the fly sniper, which I love. Him. That's yeah. that's great. <laughs> Did you see and and you talked about the the binge eating and and making yourself sick and stuff. Were you aware in yourself that that this isn't right? Did, were you aware that could you feel yourself going downhill, or, or or did it get to any point in particular where you thought, actually, do you know what this this really isn't having a good good effect on me? No, not when I was there. No, so um, I I often talk about the whole binge and the make myself vomit thing because when you say it, it does sound very unusual. But when I was there, I, I try, I'm trying to think the best way to. It's a bit like saying, um, you know what, I'm going to eat an extra donut when I shouldn't really. It's kind of, you know, you probably shouldn't really be doing it, but uh, go on then, like, you, you let yourself do it. Almost like it's some kind of treat. And it's very weird to say that, but that for me is the closest analogy I can make to it. It wasn't until I was at the Olympics the next year. Um, I wasn't doing that anymore. It wasn't with myself uh, vomit and the, sla- the fly sniper had been retired. But I, I was very angry. I wasn't sleeping properly. I was having really bad nightmares just generally incredibly unhappy and felt empty and very numb to the world. And I remember texting my best mate, who was, who was a civilian, um, similar, he's, he's one of my best mates now. And so he'd suffered with depression previously. And that ends, I know he, 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 I knew he'd been on medications. And I texted him and I said, what was the point where you said, I need some help with this? And he texted back and he went, when I didn't want to be here anymore. And I went, yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I am now. So I went to the doctor. It was so I was at, I was at the Olympics. Um, I tried to start a fight with Boris Johnson's bodyguard, uh, which was a terrible mistake because the guy was like upside down a human triangle and like six foot four, <laughs> and he was a he was a big lad. And that's not like me. I'm a very I'm a very placid person. You know, I'm I'm, I'm a loving lot of fighter. So it was that coupled with all the emotional stuff and the sleep and all that stuff that I said, you know. That, Let's go chat to somebody. Um, so I spoke to the doctor. It was a really hard conversation to have, but it was also so important. I would I would say it was life saving. So yeah, that that for me was kind of the the breaking point. You mentioned there that you know when you, your friend said that it's when he didn't want to be here that he realised. Had you got to that point? Was there a point where you 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 had thought, I I don't want to be here? And had you ever had any sort of had you ever had any suicidal thoughts at that at that moment in time? So I want, at the time I want to say I was suicidal, I would I was in a place I think a lot of people can identify with, which is you're not actively suicidal. You just wouldn't be bothered if you didn't wake up the next morning. That's where I was. So when I say I didn't want to be here anymore, I wasn't planning my suicide or I didn't want to kill myself. That that came later on. Uh, but I, yeah, if I didn't wake up tomorrow, I, I, I wouldn't have been bothered about it. I, in fact, would have been quite content, I think. I mean that's I mean uh, uh, it's a horrible place to be. I mean that's that's awful. But I'm glad that it's it led to you to reaching out to the doctor. Tell me what happened next after that then. So it's interesting. Um when I say interesting, I mean it's interesting because the 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 lack of um of progress made. So I went to the doctor, I had a conversation. That was about ten o'clock in the morning. By half one in the afternoon, I was in a car being driven back up to my parent unit from away from London. I was gutted. I was really good because I had a team of the Olympics. I was working with a security team, and I felt I didn't let them down. I felt like I thought I was faking it, all this stuff. And I was like, "What have I done? I shouldn't have said anything." Went to the doctor back in my home unit, um, my parent unit, uh, about two or three weeks later. I spoke to them, and they just uh, referred me to the military mental health services, which is called DCMH, Department of Community uh, Department of I can't remember Defence Community Mental Health Services. I think this, and um, they kind of just. I was a bit of a tick box to them, really, in terms of I'd go there. Well, I think it was, it was every couple of weeks. They'd say, Pete, how are you doing? I'd say, I'm awful. They'd say, okay, come back in two weeks. 
that that's really how it went. And it went on like that for years. Eventually, I did go on to antidepressants, and they, they were up, they were helpful. Um, nothing else really happened though, and that's kind of the whole point of antidepressants is they just decrease your symptoms. They lift you up to a point where you can then access therapeutic support. I didn't get that. So then when we moved in, mood improved because the antidepressants did say, okay, all good now, we'll take you off them. And guess what happened? I relapsed. And this happened a number of times. And this went on for probably four years, I'd say. It was a really, really long time. And things, and certainly every time I relapsed, things got worse. And I'd, I'd become suicidal. So I believe it was 2014. I made an attempt on my life. Uh, thankfully, it didn't happen. And I actually ended up becoming psychotic, so probably to about 2015. Had what, I mean, there's, there's no guy with a checkered flag at the end of this to say you finish now, but I believe it was about two months, and I began to lose touch with, with reality. It was quite mild in my case, but I believed it was my sole purpose on this earth to go fly into Syria and single-handedly go take out all of ISIS, right, who were at the time in 2015 very active. And this made total sense to me, like I was Rambo or John McLean or something. And it wasn't until my psychiatrist actually, actually then left the slip to him. Because I was planning flights and stuff and trying to find ways to find body armor and a weapon and all kinds of stuff. And I had I used to have air pistols at home and I was kind of trained with them to try and keep my, my weapons handling on, on, on top. And yeah, that's kind of how bad things got really. And it, But it was actually that conversation with the psychiatrist that made them say actually, there could be something else going on here. Because at that point, I'd been diagnosed with, I think, what was mild depression. Okay. Um, okay. That's quite a leap, isn't it? From mild depression to to uh, psychosis and then eventually to, to, to your PTSD diagnosis. PTSD. Yeah. yeah. Just listening to you then, talk about those 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 intervening years between the Olympics in 2012 and your diagnosis, which I believe was 2017. They were dark years by the, by the sounds of things. Yes. Um, yeah. Tell me, if you don't mind tell, telling me about that, that day you say you made an attempt on your own life tell me about that day um and you know what what happened so um things at work have started to deteriorate quite a lot in terms of kind of my relationship with my superiors and stuff and um i always felt like i was being watched by them and i think genuinely i probably wasn't in some way i was i was i was for example i was pulled into the office one day and they the said to me uh, i was signed up sick for a couple of days uh, because of of mental health in a bad place and I went for a meal with my wife and they said you know why are you going for meals if you sound off depressed you shouldn't be doing that and stuff and that's how things were getting and then there's one day I was sitting in the office um, and my sergeant poked his head around the corner and said can I have a word and long story short um, there was my sergeant and my flight sergeant there who was the next rank up from him and they basically said how uh, this whole mental health thing has been going on for a long time now when they were getting sick, sick of it and Guys on my unit were getting sick of it, um, and they didn't, you know, they didn't like that I had to take time off to go to, you know, therapy appointments or whatever else. And they ordered me to stop, or they were going to charge me. And when I say a charge, I mean like a military charge, which should, you know, it could be like um, they might dock your pay, a fine, they might demote you, they might put you on what what we used to call jankers, which is basically just shit jobs, basically like as as a punishment. Um, or like you'd lose a series of weekends and have to work your weekends and things like that. And it was actually that that was um, the kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And what happened, it wasn't, the thought process for me wasn't that I want to die, right? And I think that's true for many people. It's that I I, I need the pain to end. And so what happened to me is I got home after that, immediately after I had a massive panic attack. I didn't know it was a panic attack. I thought I was dying anyway. But the overriding thought in my head was that I wanted to prove them wrong. Then, you know, I just proved to them beyond that doubt that I wasn't faking it. And the way I was going to do that was to kill myself. And what happened with me is I had a, um, a 1911, Colt 1911 air pistol underneath my bed. And I had tweaked it to maybe be above power. That may, that may be recommended, if that makes sense. Um, and to, to Ill, Ill, Ill-recommended power levels. Loaded it, put the magazine in, racked the slide, put it in my mouth, and I basically sat there ne- next to the bed upstairs with my finger on the trigger. And I, I, I didn't think it would kill me, but it, for me, it was like a progression. So I think before that, I'd already tried to cut myself or something um, and sided against that. So it was kind of a progression of someone cutting myself to shoot myself. And if it, that, that didn't work, I would just do something else, basically. Thankfully, didn't do it. 
and I called my wife and said, look, you, you need to get home now. Called one of my mates there, uh, who was on base, and said, I, need, I think I had about three or four air pistols at home. I said, you know, you need to come here and take these away. And I was just an absolute mess for, for the next few days. I was a complete mess. And then went to the doctor the next day, told them what had happened, uh, both with my attempt at suicide and at work. And then shortly after that, they um, had put me on what's called a medical geographical post, which is the posh way of saying, get this person out of there because being there is not good for their health, effectively. Um, so I was posted elsewhere within three weeks, I think it was. So yeah, that's that's how it kind of played out for me. Certainly what kept me here was, it was actually my, my dog. So my dog was out at the time, but I felt like if I if I wasn't here, I wouldn't be able to walk anymore. And that's, that's still to this day, if she's still with us now, and that's one of my greatest pleasures in life is taking her for a walk, you know, twice a day. So that that was one of my, the big things for me that that stopped me from pulling that trigger. Well, Pete, thank you for for being so open and honest. I mean, that, what what um what what bravery on your part to to you know to be in that position and to to and to be brave enough to pick up the phone and ask you know and tell people and say, listen, this is where I am, because I think that's that's what you know we you know a lot of people struggle to do is to actually recognise and to and you know where they are and to pick up the phone and say, listen, I need help. But it sounds to me yeah. like you had those people at the end of the phone that you could call. So, so I'm really, yeah, thank goodness they were there. Um, Absolutely. So, tell me a little bit about how how the PTSD diagnosis actually came about. Then, so that was twenty. So we're looking at that was twenty seventeen, I believe. So, tell me how that actually came about, and then tell me what the impact of that was. Actually, having that diagnosis, did that having a label on it, did that help? So uh, I think it was it was late on 2016 I got, I got the, the diagnosis. But even, even that was really unclear. It wasn't until much later I got proper, yes, you have PTSD. But what did happen is they started to give me PTSD treatments. And I was also put on antipsychotics. So it was, it was kind of a double whammy at the time where when I realized I was on PTSD treatments and on antipsychotic medication, I was like, okay, I'm, I have PTSD and I'm, I'm psychotic. A label, it's, it's helpful in some ways because it... it adds a bit of clarity uh, to the situation and it makes it you know it gives it a name effectively as to, as to what's going on but it's also really hard because it's not nice to be diagnosed with anything or you know any condition but certainly when it's a mental health condition you feel like you're a failure you've let people down and you're weak and you know a lot of people including myself have said you know well I'm, I, I feel like I'm just faking this I feel like I should I should be able to man up through it that type of thing and I, I, I did find it hard to an extent, but at the same time as things had gotten so bad, I didn't really care what they told me. I just wanted something to be done. So yeah, that it was it, it, it was it was challenging in some ways, but it was also a relief in other ways. Started to get those those therapies and stuff, and um, I'll, I'll be honest, the MOD did the bare minimum, the absolute bare minimum of what was needed. I'm I'm still in therapy now, kind of trying to tackle the um, the aftermath of that because if the the MOD had have done what was required i probably wouldn't have needed that now so yeah it was but it was nice to have something meaningful done towards this so yeah but that, that's that's how it felt it was it was a bit of a mix sure when did you leave the military when when did your career there come to an end 2017 was my my discharge date yeah and once you had left and once you you had your diagnosis and and you 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 know um you had the medication you were taking for your psychosis did things start to improve at that point then? Did you see a, a, a an upward curve, as it were? I did, yeah. So it probably took about a year for me to get to a point where I was like, you know what, I feel like I can I can I'm gonna be able to get through this. I'm gonna I'm gonna be okay. Did a lot of work on myself, a lot of like kind of personal development work. I started reading a lot of books about, you know, habits and like how to have good relationship with people and good relationships with you with yourself and stuff. And that all really helped. And then I'm I still remember but last appointment with my military psychiatrist, I'd, I'd gotten a job in IT, in civilian IT. I was just starting there, um, wanted to make a good impression there. So I used to go wearing quite smart clothing and a nice, long, very um, quite posh jacket. And on, the, on, the, on my way to, to work, I had an appointment with my psychiatrist walks in there. And I felt like kind of like a million bucks. had like nice shoes on, nice jacket on, smart trousers, all this kind of thing. And I was like, you know what? I don't need you guys. I've got this kind of thing and uh yeah so that was that was quite nice more really yeah yeah kind of drawing a line under that chapter i suppose in a way yeah yeah 
Cool. Absolutely. So, yeah, by kind of mid-2018, things were things were getting a lot better. It was also that time that I started to write my, my, my first book that I mentioned earlier on as well. Um, yeah. At least because I'll make the, the notes on it. Yeah, so t- tell me a little bit about this. Let's, t- let's talk about the books. Let's talk about that that side of your life. And, and we touched on it earlier on, and, and you talked about it being a, that sort of outlet for you, and I can relate to that absolutely. So how did how did it um, uh, become a bit more serious in terms of wanting to 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 write books? So so you're, you're, before we got onto the children's books, you said you'd written a, a couple of books uh, about uh, your... the, uh, 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 the one. So the one. Yeah. I, I, I wrote and published a, a book called uh, "From the Bottom of the Barrel," kind of which is where I felt like I come from. That published in 2019, and it was um, you know I never never intended to be a multiple book author. But then, yeah, these these kids' books kind of came about. Um, had that night where I, I sat down and wrote the the seven books in one night. And don't get me wrong, they weren't they weren't the finished article. They were rough drafts. You know, I I um I edited them a lot before they go anywhere near the illustration or publishing. But yeah, it's I I do find it a therapeutic thing. And and these days, writing these kids' books, it's a way of me taking this really you know tough part of my life trying to turn it into a positive and then using that positive message and I try to articulate that to what a child will understand because I say that these books are kind of ages initially I said age 3 to 7 and then when I published them they were like kids 10, 11, 12 really enjoying them and stuff so I would just say 3 upwards and yeah it's, it's really nice to be able to, to use that to to help kids and help people yeah Alan I'm assuming your son's an inspiration to for those books absolutely so he was uh, he was certainly the inspiration to the first two, absolutely. So uh, the first one's anxiety, the second one is depression, and I wanted Zach to understand those things and be able to uh, communicate with us. You know, to if he if, if he felt that way, you know, at some point he will feel anxious. And what I try and get across in the book is anxiety is a normal thing. You know, we it's a normal response to things that happen in life, but if it has a prolonged negative impact on life, then it's no longer normal. It's no longer healthy. And we need to do something about it, and that's what I want Zach to to be able to do. And also, you know, if I if my anxiety gets bad, like it has been recently with the whole fireworks period, um, he's a bit young at the moment, but for him to understand why that happens, you know, and I, I'm not I'm not depressed anymore, uh, but certainly could always come back. And also, want him to understand about depression. Then it kind of went from there. So, book three is about loneliness. Book four, which is coming out just before Christmas, is is about trauma and PTSD. But in these, I'm not. I'm not talking about. I, I don't use the words anxiety, depression, PTSD, trauma, mm-hmm. uh, because a three year old just needs to know those terms. Just needs to know what, what can cause it and the feelings associated with it, in a way that you know a kid that age can understand. But also, I'm, I'm assuming so, yeah. as well because because your 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 night characters for children, I suppose it, it's it's also a case of uh, understanding what's wrong with mum or dad. Because because yes. recognizing in them some of the things that might be going on and reasons why they might be the way that they are. So I'm assuming your books yep. tackle that as well, and your nights absolutely yeah. are are yeah. those those you know grown ups that children might not understand and helping them to do yeah, so. Absolutely, yeah. So whether it's it, it, it's them going through something or the mum or the dad or the auntie or uncle or whoever the brother or sister, and I've, I've written it in a way that makes it accessible to everybody. So an adult could pick this up and. A lot of the concepts in it are quite basic, but at the same time, the adult population, generally speaking, isn't great at, at both recognising how they're doing and then to talk about it. So I've, I've tried to write it in a way that can really benefit multiple generations, including from the child's perspective, whether it's them or someone else in their family, yeah. And tell me uh, a bit about the the, the feedback. you. I'm assuming your son's got, he's got to be a... a, a guinea pig for you in terms of reading books and he's gonna is he giving you good <laughs> good feedback and um know. so he uh, as it stands he just really loves the um in, in in the anxious night there's a picture of a dragon and he and he loves the dragon so he points and goes rah um and uh he he, he he likes the picture pictures a lot more but what i've done in them is for example zach loves ladybirds so i've scattered ladybirds and throughout the books and stuff and nice um he, he, he loves that he, he's a he's a bit young at the moment to understand the concepts behind this He's getting he's getting better though, but the feedback has been brilliant. It's 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 really when you publish a book, there is a ridiculous amount of imposter syndrome there. Uh-huh. Um, you know, at the point of publishing, you're like everyone's going to hate this. I've wasted my time, wasted my money. Um, what am I doing? I who am I to publish a book about this stuff? 
Uh, and I, I had all of that, and I just went, you know what, sod it. Let's just publish and see what happens. You know, I've spent enough money on the time on this now. Let's just do it. It's been brilliant, and it's. I've, 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 I get people coming to me and telling me little stories and outcomes. So, for example, um, someone I know in, in the business world, his little boy, who I believe is about eight, I think, grabbed a little round pebble outside and put it in his pocket and said that that was his his worry, worry stone because one thing the anxious knight does is he's gifted, gifted a little round pebble and it talks about how that pebble used to be a rough, jagged stone, but it's went through life, it's gone through hard times, it's come out the other side, this nice, smooth well-rounded stone kind of thing and the fact this little eight-year-old did that and said that this this is my my worry stone and i'm like that's incredible yeah. that's that's so good and the stories of kids kind of taking their books into nursery or to school and showing their friends and stuff and i say that sounds great i mean that's that's, that's what you want and I, when i when i published my book i kind of it's like you know your friends and family are always going to say you know it's great because they're biased and they're going to tell you what you want to hear but it's the people you don't know it's the people who who come you know you've never met them before but they reach out to you and they they tell you about the impact you, your books had or what, why they've enjoyed it yeah and i'm as actually it's the same for you it's people you don't know who reach out to you with those stories that mean the most absolutely yeah yeah because like, like i'd say friends and family are always going to be supportive but it's the people who randomly reach out to you and it, it really does make you dear uh, because they they were under no obligation to do that they chose to do that and it's uh yeah it is awful and are there any more books in the pipeline, or is there is there more? There is, more, yes. more up here. The first three I published. A book four is coming out for Christmas. Uh, in this series, there's a total of seven books uh, that'll be coming out. We're tackling different subjects, so we're looking at things like loneliness and bullying, and uh, there'll be eating disorders in there. And then in the future, I'm considering the option of going th- down the route of neurodivergence. So you're talking about things like ADHD. Uh, autism, maybe discussing the subjects of bereavement because bereavement is something that's very hard for kids and perhaps adults to understand as well. So there's definitely a scope for more. It's just really e guessing the time because I've got a business and son books and I'm also studying for a degree at the moment, but also what would have the most impact for people, what would be the most beneficial thing. But yeah, there is certainly more in the pipeline. There's seven in this series and God knows how many more for other series. Sounds like you've got busy life. I don't know how you're going to fit all that in. That's pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> So listen, for anyone listening to this who, who's now sort of rapidly Googling your name to try and find the books, where where can they go uh, to find them and, and buy them for themselves? So the website is enchanted-kingdom.com, but you can also go to Amazon is where you actually buy them. So go on Amazon, type in Enchanted Kingdom, or just search for my name, you'll, you'll, you'll find my books on there. My kind of flagship book, which is book number one, The Anxious Nice, uh, if you search for that, you, you'll, you'll obviously get it and you'll see the other ones under that. Or if you want to speak to me about um, my mental health consultancy side of things in the corporate land, just search for uh, Pete White Consulting on Google and uh, you'll you'll find me on there. But uh, yeah, that's the best way to get me. Awesome. And Pete, listen, I've got to finish by asking you, what about you personally in terms of your future, looking looking ahead, looking five, ten years down the line, how do you see your own journey with your PTSD and, and life in general? It's a really interesting question because whatever I tell you is not going to be right because my life moves incredibly quickly. Um, my PTSD, I, I believe it will, it will always be a feature of my life, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm at peace with that. It's just a case of how how good can I get it where I can manage my symptoms to the point where they really don't have a big impact on me, and I'm I'm quite a good way there with that. Next five or ten years, I have no idea. I, I really don't. Um, as long as what I do has a positive impact impact for people, one of my absolute goals in life, one of my versions of sort of success is. When I'm no longer in this world, I'll have left behind something that still has some kind of benefits to people and that Zach can talk about in, in a proud fashion. So whether that's 10 years or 50 years, as long as what I do does that, I'm happy. Well, I'm sure Zach is going to be super proud. So that's amazing. Pete, listen, thank you for your time. I'm very grateful. You've been incredibly open and honest with, with telling us about your journey. And, uh, you know, it's it's been fantastic. So it's been a delight to meet you. Thank you very much for your time. Take care and uh, let's catch up again soon sometime. All the best. And you may take care. Cheers, bye bye now. Take care. Thanks. Bye. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to win a copy of Pete's book, The Anxious Night, for a little person in your life, just subscribe to the show and head to the show notes where you'll find a link to enter the giveaway. And while you're there, you can also answer our episode question, which this time around is what kind of creativity has helped your mental health? Our yes-no poll, meanwhile, 
simply asks, do you write to help your mental health? Give us a yes or a no. You can answer both on the Spotify episode page, the link to which can be found in the episode notes through the Linktree site in the show profile or the Bravefront website. You can also interact with the show by sending us a voice message. We're always really keen to hear what you think of our guests and the subjects we're discussing. You can also tell us your ideas for topics and things you'd like us to cover. Again, just head to the show notes, Linktree site or the Bravefront website for more details and the links to do so. And finally, if you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a review and subscribe, if you haven't done so already, on whatever platform you usually get your podcasts. In the meantime, though, look after yourselves. Good luck in the giveaway, and I'll see you soon. Take care.